everyone. It's Authors Night. We're here at the Calabasas Library, and we want to thank our media operations department once again for being with us and taping our event. And our guest for the session, Dr. Mary Cortini Gordon, who wrote The Chiraco Summit, Built by Love to Last in the Desert. I had the opportunity to read this book in its entirety, and it's a wonderful opportunity to have you here with us today to share quite an inspiring story of a family who immigrated to the United States, settled in the desolate southwestern desert, and created an oasis, literally an oasis, for travelers along Interstate 10. Another story of entrepreneurship by immigrants who have come to our country. So what is your relationship to this multi-generational family in history? Well, I wish I could say I had a, an actual relationship, but I do not. I am not a member of the family. And the way I ended up writing the story is that I, I used to live in the Thousand Oaks Newberry Park area, in the Caneo Valley area. I worked for Hughes at the time and then Raytheon, and I was moved to Tucson in about 2002 by the company. And so my parents and my family still live here. My par not parents no longer, but my family, my brother, sisters still live here. So I came back and forth on the freeway, the I-10. And the story place, takes place on the I-10. And you pretty much need to stop at Chiriaco Summit when you're driving the I-10 because there are long, long distances with nothing. And so I did that and I noticed the General Patton Museum and to make a long story very short, my uncle was killed in the Second World War, and I asked if they would do an exhibit of his paintings, and they did. And through that, <clears throat> I got to know Margaret Chiriaco, who is a, who is the head of the board, and um, one thing led to another from there. Well, is your own background or your roots any way com comparable to the family? What was your motivation for writing this book? The roots are comparable. I'm a first generation American. My father came from Italy. I always said my mother might, might as well have. They spoke a fluent Italian. They were hard working immigrants. And when I began to understand something about the summit, I began to see that here was an entrepreneurial group of people with an incredibly hard work, work ethic. And as I said to Margaret when she said, would you write our family story? I said, well, I'll write your family story, but I'm going to write it as the great American success story it is because I came from a background in the corporation of understanding what it takes to make a business really tick, and I could see, I could see the elements there, primarily that hard work ethic. Um, well, I think the, that's what it was, never giving up. Oh, ap you've got it exactly right. It was challenge after challenge after challenge, starting without water, basically. Now, tell me something. Your research was incredible. Well, How long you. did your research take? Probably as long as it took to write the book. Well, it took me three and a half years to write the book. Now, I'm, I'm not talking about 100% every single day because no, I was doing no, I understand. Too. But toward the end, it was 100% every single day. Um, you know, I, the way I write books is I start. I, I do it, a number of interviews and then at one point I say, Mary, you just have to sit down there and you just have to start. And I start writing. And as I write, I start to realize the things I don't know and that I need to know. For example, it became very evident to me very, very quickly that I needed to understand the building of the major aqueduct, the uh, Colorado River aqueduct. And so I started searching and I was so a wonderful, wonderful man at the Metropolitan Water District sent me a book that was their first report in 1939. So that helped me tremendously. And so as I went along, I kept realizing I need to understand about how the roads were built. There were no roads. This couple. So it was integrated, your research with your writing. It was integrated with my writing. I, I do some of it at the start, but as I'm going, I know I start to learn that I don't know enough about this. I need to learn. Where can I learn? What documents? Who do I need to talk to? And it, it circles back and forth. Um, you know, at one point, I ended up at the Metropolitan Water District for a day and a half, and they brought out all kinds of handwritten records. Because, you know, and the, the story starts in the 1930s. I should right. probably say a little bit about that. 
starts in the 1930s and it goes until today. In the 1930s, there was no I-10. Um, a, a Norwegian woman met this Italian man and they decided to start this, this travel center with nothing. There was no, there was limited water. It came trickling out of the mountains through old ancient pipes. They had no power. There was no power. So no electric lights. They were using uh, oil lamps to start with. Definitely pioneer, the pioneer very, spirit, very. the pioneer implements. That's exactly not right. today, and not of the tools we have today or yeah. any of the amenities we had today. They and started with absolutely nothing. They did start, you're right, absolutely nothing. And they built a little cafe. They had this idea. Joe, Joe Chiriaco was a surveyor on the aqueduct, and he, he could see that something was going to happen out here, even though there was nothing. It was really desolate. With great if you look accretions at, he had. Yes, and he saw without the dots were not connected for him. He had to connect them. No power, no water, but he knew that people were going to have to come down that road eventually, and he knew that a road would be built. He, as he said to well, who was his fiance at that point, how well, how do you know? He'd say, well. I work for the Metropolitan Water District. I hear everything. <laughs> so. And it's amazing to find a woman who would say, fine, let's start with nothing, dear, and work for it. I mean, not just work, but actually labor for it. Yes, and I, I asked one time, I asked one of, her, one of her daughters, I said, why would she come? She was a nurse. She yeah. was a surgical nurse working at the Coachella, Coachella Valley Hospital, which is how she met Joe because he ended up in that hospital. But she had suitors who were beer, Heineken Beer Company. There's a rumor that he was one of her suitors. So she, she had everything, really, and she met this very poor fellow. who He was one of 14 children, by the way. And that's a whole story in itself, and I cover that at the beginning of the book, is how the family came to the United States and you know, how, what happened and how he eventually left where they were living in Alabama and came west with nothing, basically nothing, and um, met her, and then she had faith in him. She believed in him. And so there she, I said, what's she doing and out here? And certainly stuck with him through all of this. Yes, it wasn't easy. No, and his it wasn't. personality was not easy. No. You no. saw that clearly, right? Because somebody who wrote, this is about writing too. When I gave a friend of mine the first draft, well, actually, she's a, she's a technical writer, and she's a very good writer, and I asked her to read this, and her answer said to me, you know, I get the sense he wasn't the easiest person to get along with. You need to go back and build that up more. So I did. I went well, back to the Well, you have a lot of feelings in, in the text, as yes. well as information. Uh, in your own life, are you involved in any other profession that would lead you to do this as a side venture or as your main venture? What is that you also do? You well, seem like a very busy person doing a lot of different things, affiliated with a lot of organizations. What I say to people when they ask me about my background is that I'm a, I'm a chameleon, that I, I handle the analytic and I handle the creative and I move back and forth between the two of them. My background is I actually have a master's degree in television production. I did work in New York City in television production long, long, long time ago when the cameras were huge and nothing was digital, okay? So long, we, we used to, ed the editing was frightening by today's standards. So we, I have that, I have a drama background. Um, I was in theater for a while. And then I left all that and went to teach school. I moved to California. I, I have From where? From, I came New from York? New York to Cleveland, Ohio for a while, and then um, I'm married in that process, and then I came out here, and um, I raised a family, four children. And so while I was raising the children, I was a teacher. I, I did, I, and as while I was teaching, we, my classes always what were wrote you a teaching? play, third grade, seventh and eighth, and then I, I actually ended up teaching in college. I taught the introductory uh, class at Cal State Northridge in research. So I did all these things. I went back to school. I got another degree in ed psych. And then I went to work for Hughes, and I was the director, I was the executive director, actually, of the Hughes Institute, which, which covered five of Howard Hughes's companies. And one of, my, one of my responsibilities was executive leadership. So this is why when I went to, when I saw what was going on at Chireco, 
I saw people with no money, no, no tremendous amount of power, but look at what they were building. And I, I looked for the leadership qualities. And you, you could see it. You could see it in Joe. You could see that he was not an easy person to get along with, but he had a partner who tempered his behaviors. And that was his, that was his wife, Ruth, Ruth Bergseed who was tremendously customer -focused. An amazing woman. What a role model she was as well as he. I'm glad you saw that. She was. She was stalwart. Um, she got up in the morning. You read about that. She was up at 6 o'clock in the morning. Oh, no, she was up before 6 o'clock in the morning. Because she had travelers coming expecting breakfast. Who was going to make it except for her at first? So she made it. Next thing you know, they've got chickens. And the kids are getting older, and part of their job is collecting the eggs for the chickens. But you know what? This, this, this is a piece of the research in here. They can't use those chickens. They can't use those eggs because of health department regulations. So they have to buy their eggs, but they use those for the family. So it's the, there's a lot of complication in a little travel stop like that. For so long ago, so many regulations even then. Right. But, you know, you look at a place like that and you say, you stop there and you get your gas and you drive on. But there's a lot that goes on every single day. It's 24-7 business. There's a lot that goes on day and night there. And so, you, you know, there, I say this is what, what makes up the fabric of America. People like, like the Chiriacos. They're working day and night. They're, serve, they're a service organization. Um, and what will we do without them on the highways? They're very typical, I think they're typical, of many, many people who we kind of take for granted. Well, interesting you say that. The two things I personally uh, got from the book were two things that people take for granted that they never should. They don't realize. One is the service personnel, like you brought up. The hours they have to keep, the temperaments they have to tolerate from mm -hmm. the other people. They get the brunt of a tire that's blown or a train or a plane that they missed. They work regardless of the weather. They get up early. They work late. They're paid poorly. And they rely upon us not only to help their salaries by the tipping, by the, but by the courtesies, by treating them as a person of value, not just someone to serve us. And yet, you know, they, I don't think I ever got the sense that they thought that way. And we should certainly think that way. But their attitude was to make everything comfortable for the customer, for the traveler. That, that well, that's there. right. They gave unprecedented, even to this day, care to each person that they met. And it was like a friend more than a traveler. And just one more thing, and then we'll take a short break. You mentioned little water. We turn on our faucet, we waste the water. It's an endangered commodity. We let the tub just build up higher. We brush our teeth with the water on. We flush toilets continually. We overwater our lawns. And so in that that's such an important point in this story and any story in the desert. I start the book and mentioned several times something that the father, the father of the 14 children, Joe was number two, said to his children over and over again when he came across on the boat across the Atlantic when he immigrated here, he said, wine was free, but we had to pay for water. And Joe never forgot that, never forgot that. Now, what are some of the, well, we mentioned some of the obstacles, but what are the greatest obstacles? the greatest things they had to overcome, to trudge onward. So there were natural obstacles, like water, which we talked about a bit. I mean, they went from the pipes, the, uh, something like 10 miles of pipes, many of which he laid himself. Yes. And it wasn't just that they were pipes coming out of the springs. Th this is interesting because the springs come out of basically where the San Andreas Fault goes. And the, so there's a theory that at one point in the 70s, that's when it happened, we had some big earthquake. Anyway, that the, the fault moved a bit and that basically shut down some of those springs so their water was trickling. So now they witched a well, which is really interesting to me, 
interesting to me. So I learned about that. And it actually, it actually worked for them. Whether you believe dowsers, it. too. A dowser. They had a dowser. And say, which that well. And so the water story goes on and on and on to the end of the book when they finally, in the year 2000, get aqueduct, and by, aqueduct water, long. which reminds you, by the way, aqueduct ran right behind them. And General Patton, when General Patton was there, because he was in that area, his water person told me, because he was still alive at the time, that General Patton just took the water and asked later. <laughs> but, you know, you can't do that if you're the Chirico family. So anyway, they had no power. So they, they had to put in generators. No electricity. No electricity. They, they put in generators, big generators, and those generators would break down. So they'd have to, and if they broke down, they had to go out in the middle of the night, it didn't matter when, themselves. and fix those. And fix those themselves. They learned to fix that. They did their own plumbing. They did their own plumbing. Joe knew how to plumb uh, from take those pipes and bring them in. And so they, yes, they had, you know, toilets and everything else, that modern, modern facilities. So yes, they did their own plumbing. What um, about building materials? Um, he had to truck those in, and they, he was trucking those in before they opened. He was, he, from his MWD paycheck, he was saving a little bit every month. This was in the late early 1930s, late, actually late 20s, so that he could buy wood to build his first building. And his wife's family was out here. His, she was one of nine living children. There were 12, but, but three of them died in childhood. Anyway... Her brothers had come out ahead of her, and they were in Ventura County. They were Seabees. That's how they got out here. And, Maybe. Um, yes, and they learned to build. And so one, one of them came out and helped build that. They, I think they built it in a matter of weeks, that first little building. So, yes, they had to get building materials. They had to truck ice because the travelers that were coming by wanted cold beverages. And they were they they started making bologna. They didn't have hamburgers. It was bologna sandwiches. That what you that got. That started with the bologna. Bologna yeah. sandwiches. And they had to keep the meat cold. So um, you know it's it's just amazing when you stop to think. How would you start something out there with no water, no power? How did they get fuel for their trucking and everything? Well, were there gas stations? Was it? They had a gas station. They had their own gas. They had their own gas station. How'd they get fuel for their own gas well, the station? Well, the gas the the. Whoever the union, it was you started with Union Oil, so Union Oil would deliver the gas at various amounts of time. So yes, they um, that you know they he there's a question is how would he finance all this? Well, he saved money, and he, he saved he saved and his wife saved also. She was a nurse for a while. They both saved, but yeah. in addition to that, he he went into Indio and places like that. And and set up deals for loans. He he created, which he paid off very very quickly. They were pretty much loan fee loan free by the end of the 1940s. Didn't they use a lot of their children to help? Was the whole family was involved? Well, the whole family was, but the but their help was wanderers. Wanderers would come by looking for a job, and Joe would hire them. He'd give them a chance, and some of them stayed for years. Some of them wandered on. There's a story about one who stayed for years and years and years, and he became all, he became a family member in effect, like a grandfather to the kids. But yes, the children worked, and um, there were four children. Uh, today, Margaret, the second child, is the CEO. Before her, Bob, Robert, her brother was the CEO. Um, and you look at this, and, and and there's four generations out there. And they educated their children well. Education was a priority. It's amazing that they were able to do that. Well, by the time they were in college, they were probably doing fairly well. I mean, not stupendously, but they were doing fairly well. He, enough that he, they could send their kids to college. Two of them went to UCLA, and the other two went to uh, uh, these Arizona State, Northern, Northern Arizona State University. So they, they went to good schools. And... Um, one got a business degree, two became teachers, and Margaret, the one who's out there now, actually had an art degree. Yes, but uh, she's quite the businesswoman. Oh my goodness, she's quite the businesswoman. Yes. Well, she inherited that. I mean, for somebody to start with nothing and end up with what they have now is an amazing inspiration. And her daughter is a CFO, and when he, she was a little girl, she was under, she was in a bassinet under Joe's desk, and as Joe continued you know continued, continued the business and as she grew older she learned about all the finances from him and he met he was determined to reconcile everything to the penny 
Now, you mentioned General Patton previously. Isn't there a Patton Museum out there? There is a Patton Museum, and what happened was that sometime in the late, no, early 1940s, 1940 or 41, I think it was, Joe was always outside with the gas station. So he noticed this plane circling overhead. And then one day, someone came into his cafe, tapped him on the shoulder, and said, do you know where Joe Chireko is? And Joe said, so Joe, in his sur very surly character, said, so who wants to know? And he looked up, and he saw all this brass in front of him, and it was General Patton. And so General Patton wanted to know who he, where he was and who he was because he knew that Joe, Joe knew the area, and he wanted to know the names of the mountains and everything else. He brought... Uh, General Patton brought in over a million troops. Oh, by the he, when he left, there weren't a million there. But by the time the Desert Training Center, which was put out there, was closed, there were over a million troops who were trained on tanks to to be used in the Africa the invasion in Africa. And um, so imagine this: that you've got this little cafe, and one day twenty or thirty people might come in there. You might make a few bologna sandwiches, sell a little bit, and you fill up a few gas tanks. The next day, there are 300 soldiers. Yes, 300 soldiers. And right then and there, they should have failed. But like everything else, they made it work. They just worked. They became a 24-7 operation. Ruth found all her friends to make pies because the soldiers loved pies. Um, they love pickles, pig, pig, pickled pig's feet, which I don't quite understand. But Joe, Joe found a way to import that. He got a huge. He found a way to get a big outdoor refrigerator, and I mean, they just made it work. And no matter what happened out there, they made it work. Now, every time we go to the desert, we always go to the World War II, the airplane museum, the air museum. And if, I don't know what it's called, maybe the aviation museum, and they have so much World War II memorabilia and films that I love to watch. Right. How far away is that museum from the Patton Museum? Are you talking about the Air and Space Museum in Tucson? No, Palm Springs. Oh, it's not too far from Palm Springs. Probably 30, 40 minute drive. But the General Patton Museum is... It's still going on then. Yes. The General Patton Museum, they just recently, they were just endowed by Chandri, who is a, is a philanthropist and a extremely successful businessman out there and another very famous businessman out there they just endowed them with two new buildings which they've opened so the museum has grown a lot and there are outdoor walls there's the the, the Vietnam West wall is there Korean War wall World War two wall um, there's a the there's a Leonardo da Vinci exhibit that this Air and Space Museum in San Diego couldn't maintain any longer, so send it out there. There's a lot there in the, at the Patton Museum. And Helen Patton wrote the preface to this book. And her mother, yes. her, her mother wrote a beautiful, beautiful letter loving the book. General Patton had a son named General Patton. So there are two General Pattons. So Helen Patton is the granddaughter of General Patton, the one most people know, and the daughter of Major General Patton, who is his son. So I'm very proud that she was involved. Well, after, it's a great thing that they persevered because after the war, uh, sort of entered in a period of prosperity starting with the 50s, and things kind of changed for them, didn't it? Yes. Prior to that, prisoners of war were out there, which was a total surprise to me. The Italian prisoners of war, and Joe spoke fluent Italian. So that was lucky. So they were there for two or three years. They had to take everything down. I mean, there were... 18, I think it was, I, I don't want, I have to, if I try and get this number right, it was 18,000 acres, I believe, that General Patton had taken over, and there were tents and all kinds of equipment out there, so they had to, they had to demilitarize the zone, basically. But yes, the 50s came along, and it was very idyllic, and it was quiet, but the business kept growing, and because the, the um, traffic kept coming, you know, the people kept coming. Um, it, in those chapters, and particularly in the 50s, I, I, the family grows. And so what, a lot of what I talked about were stories about the family growing and really funny little stories about, you know, in the desert there, 
They learn to drive. Yet, so they learn to drive. Yeah, and they learn to drive at fourteen. So there's a cute little story about the teenage girl wanting to learn to drive and and how she's out. Oh, so the Patton had an airport, and by the way, he bought the land at five dollars an acre from Joe Chirico for that airport. And um, Eileen Heimacher is her name. She wants to learn to drive. So Margaret says, "Come on, we'll go learn to drive." So they go out on the airport on the tarmac of the airport, driving back and forth, and it's a stick shift. And Eileen came from a family that didn't have stick shifts. They weren't poor, and Margaret learned to drive a stick shift. So the long story short is she comes off the edge of the airport, and she goes, makes a left turn and is incredibly proud of herself because she made her first beautiful left turn. But the car keeps turning. It's a truck. It keeps turning around the chicken coop. And then it slams into the chicken coop, and suddenly there's 20 chickens all over the place. And the reason the story is important is because Margaret runs after her father. And I, to, because in the meantime, Eileen starts running up the mountain. Margaret knows there are rattlesnakes and all kinds of dangerous things up there. She goes to get her father, and Eileen is running, running, running. I killed a chicken, I killed a chicken. And, Joe, and she knows Joe, Joe is going to come after her. And Joe's temper was known all the way up and down the highway, even to Indio where she lived. And so she's running away from Joe, basically. He goes and he comes, catches her finally. He puts his arms around her and says, it's okay, it's okay. And she tells later in the story about how, what, how his personality is, that he, he seems really gruff, but he's really a very loving person. What I especially appreciated looking at and enjoying in the book were your photographs. Where did you get all those photographs? And how? Some of them are archival which means that they were in family albums. Some of them were loose. Some of them were on, in pictures on walls. But and which I, member of the family did you get them? No, they're pretty much some of them. Pauline, some. the oldest sister, sent me a whole bunch of pictures. But there were many stored, and I spent hours and hours going through albums. And as I wrote the story, I thought, you know, I want, for example, there's a character named Bob Howe in the picture. He's one of the wanderers, and he's, a, he's an important character in the story really wanted a picture of him. And we and finally found one, as, almost as this book went to press, I found that photo. Um, you know, so I wanted the pictures, I wanted pictures of Joe as a young man, I wanted Ruth as a young woman, I wanted pictures that showed them at the gas station, I wanted pictures that showed you what did that old gas pump look like. You know, so I found those, but it took a while, and not only that, they have to be scanned properly, so they weren't, so then they had to be done over again, and so anyway, uh, there are over there are about 90 photographs in this picture. So many of them I took. Every time I went out there, I would take photos. I, I uh, Robert Chiriaco took me on a tour into the desert. I, I so took some of these are yours. Many of them are mine. I did a hike from where I wanted to see the pipes. I did an eight mile hike. Um, the National Park Service was wonderful. They provided me two guides. So a lot of the pictures of the pipes are my pictures. Um, but it's a combination of archival photos and modern day photos. And then what was your first book? Tricky one, Teak Slow. It means Eye of the Eagle, and it's a story of a Native American being used at UCLA, by the way, in the advanced uh, uh, Native American studies along with the law school. They're using that particular book. It's a story of Charlie Cook, who was very much involved. Oh, yes, he did uh, a ceremony for our city when we first incorporated yes. a sage ceremony. But like with the Chiriacos, I observed Charlie. I was the director at at, UC, at uh, Hughes at the time when I met him, and I, I thought, oh my goodness, I'm dealing men with men. It was mostly men, in their shiny shoes and beautiful suits, and you know all the money they had behind them. And here was Charlie, who had no actual um, position. He had no actual funding, but he did have power, and it came from inside. And he galvanized people behind him to do all kinds of things. Very here charismatic in the center. individual. He was very charismatic and very dedicated to, to um, saving Indian burial sites, saving our, na our natural mountains here, um, working with the National Park Service and state parks, um, pro making sure people understood the heritage that he was leaving behind, on, uh, and you're right, he was very charismatic, and he, he somehow, without money and without, I can't say power, but without money and without a position, 
he had prestige and power, and people, people followed him. They respected him and admired him, and, and we I miss him. And I felt that with yeah. everything that he was doing, and he, he was a truck driver, by the way. He would drive his mixer truck during the day, and then at night he'd go to meeting after meeting after meeting, promoting the conservation, basically. And um, I felt that he was the kind of person, again, he's, he's a, a, an American citizen who didn't really get much um, press. I, he got a lot of press, but I think he should have been memorialized. Mean, I felt he should be memorialized, and so I wrote his story. And I said, how I feel about the Chiriacos. There's so many people who are not famous, but that doesn't mean they're not doing important things. They're doing important things, and I like writing about them. What are you going to write about next? I haven't decided. I had some people ask me to write stories, and um, I have to. You, you have to feel that that is something you really want to do. Cause it's a tremendous amount of time and commitment, and I never feel when I if it didn't feel when I was writing either one of these stories that it was a burden. It was something I got up every day and loved doing, and before I knew it, it was five or six o'clock in the afternoon, and that's how it needs to be. And if I don't. I don't feel that the story is something I should write, then I, I won't write it. I had somebody telling me, really wanted me to write a story about a man who um, is an important man, but I felt she should write the story of her great-grandfather herself. And I, I wasn't, it wasn't something I wanted to write, because when I write these stories, I like to bring them into the present day, Like, and I hope we get a chance to talk a little bit about Chereka present day, because... That's what's interesting, is to see how the values are passed on and how those values matter as time goes on and how, it, how those values build something. With Charlie, they built an, an understanding of the Native American culture in this area. People really didn't understand who the Chumash were, who the Tongva were, who the Native Americans in this area were until he came along and did that, those kinds of ceremonies that you're talking about and talked to people about the culture and about the importance and the value system of that culture. And the same with the, the um, Chiriacos. You know, I say that one of the things that Ruth and Joe did m splendidly was pass on to their children the ethics that they had, the work ethic, and the, the value system they had about life and loving. So there are love stories in this book and about loving, about real loving. And then They've passed it on down to the next generation. They're in the fourth generation there now. Well, how can our, how can members of our public get this book? I know it's in our in our Calabasas library, but if they want a copy for their own library, how would you suggest that they get some of your well, books? Well, I, I really would really do hope people do read this story because I think it's an important American success story. It's at e the easiest way is either Amazon or Barnes and Noble. I've spoken at Barnes and Noble, so you know e either one of them um, works fine. It's easy. Um, if you have Amazon Prime, you get it like that. Yes. And um, so it's that they're out at the summit. They're selling hundreds of copies out there. They're at the Patton Museum, and they're there are three stores at Joshua Tree National Park. And we're trying to move it in in other places too. Well, I look forward to us. Uh, reading your first book. I only read this one, and I want to thank you so very much for being an honored guest for this session. I'm very grateful that you were able to come to us well, and I present your story and introduce yourself to me personally. I want to thank everyone at the City of Calabasas who make our program possible, and I want to remind you that we are also supported by the Friends of the Calabasas Library, and if you're interested in joining the group, they meet the first Wednesday evening of each and every month. And I leave with another quote. This is an old Chinese proverb. The faintest ink is better than the best memory. Thank you, everyone, and we'll see you again soon.